This is Michael Cole, uh, VP of Marketing at Everflow. Today, I'm uh, joined by James. Can you give a quick introduction about yourself? Sure. Hey, everybody. I'm James Creech, co-founder and CEO of Paladin. We build influencer marketing software for agencies, media companies, talent managers, and creator networks. So our software taps into uh, the social platform APIs across YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Twitch. Also working with TikTok, though they don't have any analytics APIs just yet. But we help people uh, with influencer discovery, so searching for new talent, uh, managing their influencer relationships in a private central CRM, and then tracking campaigns and reporting on that progress in real time to their clients. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's like the, the best thing about being able to do these videos is just getting a chance to like speak with people that are like living and breathing in different worlds because there's a distinct lack of like, what is that middle ground knowledge there's a lot of beginner influencer marketing stuff, but then like once you're actually in influencer marketing, how do you, do you actually like scale it and grow it and optimize it? Like those are all things that are harder to find. So I'm really excited for this conversation today. Um, just to kick it off, can you tell us a little bit about your background with influencer marketing? Sure. So I started my career in ad tech. I was working with brands and media agencies to help them run paid ad campaigns, primarily in video and really around the dawn of social. So. Uh, early campaigns on YouTube before uh, the TrueView ad unit existed, before Google was doing a lot of heavy video advertising on the site itself. Uh, we were helping uh, brands promote their content and get, get discovered on the platform. After that, I went and worked at um, an influencer agency, a creator network, uh, basically a company that was focused on helping social media stars on platforms like YouTube and Instagram grow their audience, uh, you know, work with advertisers to, to increase their revenue, uh, and find ways to think about advancing their career. And you know, at that time, um, you know, six or seven years ago, we were doing just about everything by hand, right? This was such a new field, an emerging industry that software solutions didn't really exist, right? We were finding influencers just by going down rabbit holes on, on YouTube or Instagram search or even earlier platforms, right? Like Vine and, and, and things like that. And so uh, we were searching manually. We were managing relationships just over email and, and trying to track payments and and kind of stitching everything together, right? And so out of necessity, we started tinkering, just building some tools for ourselves because we had to figure out a way to save time and automate the process. And through that, we realized, you know, hey, clearly we can't be the only ones banging our head against this wall. Everyone else must be wrestling with the same problems. So, uh, you know, I was, I was pretty new to this new industry and just started meeting everyone I could from uh, competitors to other people in the, in the space, just anyone who would give me five minutes to chat or, or get together for coffee. I just wanted to learn as much as I could. And so through those conversations, I found out most people were tackling it the same way, way that we had, which was either combination of manual efforts or trying to build some internal tools. And so uh, that's what gave us the inspiration. And along with two of my business partners, we said, okay, let's quit our day jobs, focus on this full time. We launched Paladin almost five years ago at this point to say, you know, we're going to build enterprise software for this emerging class of influencer agencies, creator networks, people who are empowering uh, people to run better and smarter influencer marketing campaigns. Yeah, I'd love to unpack a little bit about that. I mean, I think probably like five plus years ago, everyone was talking about how like YouTube influencers were like the big thing. Mm -hmm. And I feel like you don't hear that so much more mm -hmm. anymore. It might just be because it's so common now that like it's no longer noteworthy. But can you talk about like a little bit about like YouTube influencers in specific and how brands are being successful with them? Yeah, YouTube is really what started it all. I mean, if we want to go back in time, there are influencer marketing has existed forever, right? From the days of, uh, uh, you know, celebrity endorsements to uh, thinking about um, some of the iconic examples of influencer marketing in the past where, you know, brands would find thought leaders or influential people who would share things in their social circles. I mean, th that's not a new practice. What's changed about it fundamentally is the internet and social media. And it's also really changed media and entertainment because historically, whether it was television or radio or even film, these uh, mechanisms of content distribution were controlled by small entities, right? You had a handful of radio broadcasters or television networks or, or film companies, 
and they would decide what gets made, uh, who stars in it, how it's distributed, how it's monetized. And with the dawn of social media, YouTube kind of really blazing away, uh, anyone could be a creator and anyone could reach an audience and, and monetize that fan base. Uh, and so, yes, you had before this, you had websites, you had blogging, but YouTube started it all in terms of rich media. You have video, you have this really engaging format in which people can, you know, reach subscribers. YouTube rolled out with the monetization program very early on, and that created a mechanism in which now there's two-way communication. There's this democratized access to uh, broadcasting and to, to building an audience. And so that's really what, what got early traction. And the fact that you know, Google acquired it early on and put its resources behind it meant it could reach a global scale and it just continued to grow. So yes, you had um, early, early success stories on YouTube. You also had investment on the platform from Google. You had uh, an investment in an enterprise ecosystem through the form of multi-channel networks at MCNs, which have evolved and changed the business model significantly since the early days. But there was this infrastructure to support it. And that has, you know, of course, um, then expanded to other platforms as Facebook has grown and then acquired Instagram. You had Musical.ly then acquired by ByteDance and now TikTok is, is very successful in the influencer marketing space. Uh, so there have been a lot of countless examples, but social media platforms are really what have brought us into today's era of influencer marketing. Mm -hmm. And specifically for YouTube though, like how do brands use YouTube now to mm -hmm. like promote their own products? Yeah. So, you know, many brands have, uh, have invested heavily in creating content, right? So they have either their media agency partners who create awesome creative on their behalf. Many brands have even brought this in-house. Uh, some have built their whole brand identity around it. If you think about someone like Red Bull, right, early to believe in kind of this brand as a studio model. Um, Mercedes has done that. Many other examples have done that where they realize that video and storytelling is a great way to connect with their audience and, and build a brand identity and, and uh, aspirational brand value. And so that's, that's been happening on YouTube for a long time. Uh, but of course, you know, there's this homegrown talent on YouTube, YouTubers or influencers that brands want to collaborate with. One, because they have an audience. That two, they understand how the platform works. And so brands kind of started off by putting pretty polished commercials on the platform. And I think there's been a change over time. You'll still see really great, beautiful creative from brands but you'll also find uh, content that looks a little bit more like YouTuber content, right? Like it's very casual. It, it uh, uses the editing style or the formats that have grown up on YouTube, right? YouTube has given us things like unboxing, things like, you know, <laughs> let's play gaming videos that never would have seen the light of day in traditional TV. And a brand would have never thought to probably create a video like this, but these YouTubers or these influencers on a platform have come up with uh, these really engaging formats that people seem to love. And brands now will, will adapt those formats or, the, or they will partner with an influencer to do an integration and create awesome creatives together. Awesome. And why do you think that brands should focus on influencer marketing in 2021? Yeah, I mean, there's a number of reasons, but the first one is probably the fact that it works, right? Compared to other traditional forms of spending, whether that's television advertising, out of home, print, et cetera, even comparing it to other digital spending, influencer marketing is uh, just more engaging for a lot of audiences, particularly younger audiences who are you know, tired of interruptive advertising. We all grew up with, um, you know, ads on TV. And then we got, oh, you know, this great thing called TiVo where we can fast forward and skip the ads. So now there's on-demand, you know, uh, programming through SVOD services like Netflix and Hulu. And if you subscribe, you don't have to pay for advertising. So people are used to this idea that, you know, ads are typically interruptive or they're taking me out of the content experience rather than uh, a native or organic part of the content itself. And so influencer marketing, when done successfully, right, when done the right way, weaves it into the content, makes the storytelling of the narrative possible. And so that's really powerful when you can say, okay, this, this creative wouldn't have existed without the brand supporting it. And so people just tend to uh, engage more with that. The audience has, um, is more comfortable and, and they're more receptive to the advertising message. That's number one. Number two is just kind of the, the realities of 2020. Coronavirus has uh, dramatically changed media and entertainment, particularly the advertising landscape. Um, you know, it, it remains to be seen what will happen, but in the early days, kind of Q1, Q2, a lot of advertisers paused spending. 
Um, there was concern over what creative is, is sensitive and appropriate in this environment. We don't want to come across as tone deaf. Uh, and then it's, you know, a lot of things can't shoot. A, a lot of production companies or traditional commercial outlets couldn't produce content, at least initially. They didn't know, how, you know what are the proper protocols? How do we do that safely? But influencers, right, a single person in their bedroom or with a camera or a phone can create content and distribute it easily. So influencer marketing emerged as this, you know, means, this, this available opportunity to advertise that was effective. So I think we're, we're seeing that the fact that COVID has accelerated a number of these digital trends, like cord cutting, you know, like the fact that there's not a lot of new live programming on television uh, because production is halted on traditional film and TV. And so as a result, more and more of that spending is shifting to, to digital and particularly to social and influencer marketing at an accelerating rate. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm pretty sure like half the products I bought in the last year came from some podcast mentioning it. Yeah. Because once Other you feel like alignment and like you really just want to support them because you respect what they're doing, like it, it's much easier to buy what they are promoting. Exactly. Right. There's a level of uh, familiarity. There's a level of trust that you build with an influencer. If you listen to them all the time, you you feel like, oh, this person is my friend, right? That's how a lot of youth now feel about the influencers that they follow. They, they listen to them all the time. And it's this really authentic content of like, this is my daily life, or this is me in my bedroom talking to you about something I care a lot about. And so it builds this relationship between the viewer and, um, you know, the the influencer. And oftentimes, you know, that that, that relationship is uh, built upon by the fact that you can engage with them directly, right? You can leave a comment and they might acknowledge it, you know, uh, they might respond to you or they might acknowledge it on air. So there's these, this feedback mechanism makes it feel like a two-way, a two-way relationship. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, get a little tactical. So if you were launching an e-commerce brand, like say you're just finishing it and then it starts at 2021, like what would you do to leverage influencer marketing to promote that brand? Yeah. Well, number one, any e-com brand that's looking at influencer marketing should think about what's the end goal, right? In many cases, it's probably sales. What can we do to drive purchase intent, conversion, right? Activity, uh, and then work backwards from there. So we've, we've got the goal in mind. Uh, what, what is the plan to reach that audience, right? So, okay, who, who is the ideal customer profile for the product that we're selling? Where do those people already spend time? Is it podcasts? Is it Instagram? Is it other social platforms, blogs, et cetera? Uh, from there, who are the people that they already trust? Who are they listening to? What type of content formats are they used to engaging with? And then as a brand, can we reflect that in the content that we're creating? And can we partner with the right influencers to bring unique content to life? Can we put together an offer that's compelling and that is meaningful, right? You want to find alignment in the brand message along with the influencer values and what they talk about with their audience. And then the best influencer campaigns always combine, uh, you know, something unique that the brand and influencer are doing together. So the strategy should be informed by both parties. It's not, the brand shouldn't just contribute money to the conversation, right? Or to the mm -hmm. equation, they should be bringing in the influencer and work together in a true collaboration to have ideas and say, Hey, like we were able to make this incredible piece of content or and present you with this awesome offer to buy this product that, you know, at me as an influencer, I've tested, I love, and I recommend wholeheartedly, you know, those are the most successful influencer campaigns. And then the last and probably most fundamental and important piece is you have to measure and optimize that performance over time. The beauty of influencer marketing on social platforms is that you get real-time data. So you have that direct feedback loop, and then you have insight into what's working and what's not working and how do we do better, right? And so... Mm -hmm. How can we start from you know the top of funnel metrics of reach and engagement impressions and viewership, all the kind of key awareness driving factors that are important to to an ad campaign? But then, if we're really thinking as an ecom brand about performance, how are we optimizing towards clicks, conversions, right? Time on site. What are the key things? What coming back to our original goal? What is delivering on those KPIs? And what can we do in the next campaign to further improve performance? Mm -hmm. And so for the first part of that, how do you actually identify who, who actually has residents? Say, say you're promoting like a shoe brand or something, like how do you figure out which influencers actually have resonate, like resonance and like a following that actually will be interested? Sure. Uh, it's a blend of art and science, right? There's data and, and technology that you can leverage, but there's also should be a human understanding, review of the content, understanding of the influencer culture to make that successful. 
uh, you know, at Paladin, we build software to help make that easier, but it doesn't mm -hmm. replace the fact that a good set of um, you know, human review and, and, and eyes on the content to make sure you're, you're building the right partnerships is the way to go. Um, you know, I, I'll tell you the way most brands probably approach it, the, or a, a word of caution in, in a way not to do it, is to just mm -hmm. go to a tool or search on YouTube or Instagram and say, hey, I'm looking for who's creating shoe content today. Yes, that will yield results. You can find advertiser, you know, influencers that are already talking about sneaker culture or shoes and you know, would be a good fit for your brand, but you will reach probably a local maximum. It will mm -hmm. quickly saturate that market. And um, you will probably find that that's exactly what your competition is doing also. So yes, you can find those people and create great content and, and successful campaigns, but you can also find influencers in other verticals, other categories that still reach your audience, right? We're trying to reach, you know, young women 18 to 34 in the US. Okay, where else are they spending time? What other content do they listen to? If it's lifestyle, if it's travel, if it's, you know, parenting, right? Anything that, that um, isn't just someone talking about shoes all the time and then, okay, we're gonna keep serving up shoe ads. Uh, you can create really engaging promotions with people who have different content strategies, but could be a big fan of the shoe and it will be relevant to their audience. Yeah, I think that definitely boils down also to just like, you have to understand like what you like about your product and then figure out why other people would like it and who would be best for reaching that audience. Exactly. Cool, so um, are there specific types of products that are the most successful with influencer marketing? Like what is the anatomy of something of like, say you're, again, if you're starting your own company, like what elements should be in place for influencer marketing to be extremely effective? Yeah. You know, I thought a bit about this before we sat down today. And, and I do think that uh, influencer marketing can be successful in just about any industry or for any product or company. Um, mm -hmm. But maybe someone listening can prove us wrong. That, um, there may be examples out there in which it perhaps isn't a good fit. But, you know, when you think about influencer marketing, oftentimes we think of the canonical examples of fashion and beauty products, right? Um, uh, parenting or uh, software, toys for kids, right? That were these, these direct examples of, I see an influencer promoting this product that makes me more aware of it, more interested in purchasing it, I'll do some research. But, you know, there's probably less obvious examples in which influencer marketing is still really successful. Most of the examples we think of tend to be B2C, right? Or, or often even direct to consumer where, you know, um, there's, uh, here's a travel destination or a travel booking website or something that, you know, you want to promote, but influencer marketing can also be very successful in a B2B context, right? So you, you think about platforms like LinkedIn or Twitter, um, you know, we went through a, a political campaign recently and, and here in the U S I think there was a great amount of influencer marketing and social media marketing that was applied to political uh, issues, policies, candidates, Right. So it can be applicable in a variety of fields and through a variety of lenses. Uh, the key thing to understand is, is just returning to the fact of, OK, understanding the audience, where are they spending time? What's the appropriate messaging to reach them effectively? And have you seen any B2B brands that you think are really nailing it when it comes to influencer marketing? Oh, that's a good example or a good question. Um, I'm sure there are some fantastic ones and I, uh, nothing immediately comes to mind, I suppose. Um, I guess like VaynerMedia is an example of this, right? Gary Vaynerchuk is, is probably built an empire around being an influencer and, and being an inspirational kind of entrepreneur, but he essentially runs an agency business that serves other companies to think about their strategy. And he's kind of a living, breathing example of that. There, there are other kind of entrepreneur founder types who will use influencer marketing, use their public persona as a way of driving interest in, in their brand and the, the products that they promote. Uh, so yeah, you know, I, I think we see some really great examples of that on, again, LinkedIn and, and Twitter tend to be the most common ways of kind of micro blogging or sharing thoughts and, and connecting with people. Um, but, you know, there are, are other, um, really good examples of, of people who do that through newsletters, right? Newsletters have kind of had this resurgence um, in terms of like how they, uh, they create content. So there's, um, there are a number of newsletters I follow. Stratechery is one of my favorites where, you know, he's built this 
freemium offering and he's got great uh, strategy and insights that he shares. He now has launched a podcast. Podcasts have also kind of proven <laughs> a successful means for B2B influencer marketing. And maybe the, the most iconic example of that is Gimlet Media, right? With the startup podcast where they essentially mm -hmm. created a show about what they were doing, yeah. right? And that was part of their success story. So yeah, I mean, there are so many examples when you, I guess when you sit down and think about it of B2B brands who are leveraging influencer whether that's through social, whether that's through podcasts, whether that's through newsletters to, to build an engaged following. Yeah, the example that I'm a little obsessed with right now is uh, Gong.io, which is like the sales SaaS software, but like they've turned their like employ, like their marketing team, a few of them have become the influencer and they basically spend their time leveraging, creating their own team into that powerful influencer and like, they've just been growing like crazy. Like they double every year, like they're an insane success story. And it's about like turning your, like sort of like giving the spotlight to your own team mm -hmm. and making them an influencer in that space. And I think that it's, it's like a really cool way to create a virtuous cycle inside of a company. Yeah, that's really powerful. We've seen this new trend in terms of employee adv advocacy, but also customer advocacy, right? How can you get your existing customers to become ambassadors for your brand? How can you make your employees uh, you know, so excited to share what your brand is building and, and the message and, and bring people into that? Because personalities and uh, human connection is often what drives people or attracts them to a brand. And so leveraging your, your current employee and, and customers is a great way to, to do that. Have you seen anyone doing it effectively for customers? Like the, the tricky thing is that like everyone's busy so anytime you're asking them to do something extra, like there's always that back and forth of like, do they have time to do it now? Um, have you seen anyone doing it really effectively? Yeah, uh, the, the best examples I think of are in the gaming space, right? Gaming has had a huge year with all of us are stuck at home and on our phones, <laughs> probably playing a lot more games than normal. Uh, but, but gaming, uh, you know, when you think of the big publishers, everyone from Riot uh, to uh, Epic Games, right? With, with huge titles, right? Like League of Legends or Fortnite. What they'll do is they'll take their really enthusiastic players, esports athletes, right? Other customers or, or you know, big fans of the games that they play. And then they'll give them early access to content. They'll give them special skins or rewards in game because they know that in turn, their influencers who are kind of waving the, the banner, carrying the flag for the brand, so they want them to feel a close affinity. They want them to feel taken care of and have that kind of special level of, of access um, to, to the brand content. So gaming is, is where we see a lot of that. But, um, you know, I think there are other examples too in which, you know, people are finding ways to turn customers into ambassadors. Uh, we think of review sites like G2 or Captera or Trust Radius, right? These are ways of saying, hey, leave a review that helps other people discover our software. Oftentimes there are rewards for the customers to, to contribute. So, you know, we're seeing this become productized to an extent as well. Yeah, it's super interesting. I wonder if there'll be opportunities in the future for things like help, like beauty products where customers that purchase a certain amount get like their own like sort of platform experience. I don't know. I think that there's interesting things to unpack there in terms of like new opportunities that haven't really been done yet. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, is it, so with a, like a brand new company, like what factors should be in place before they start like actively pursuing an influencer marketing strategy? Yeah. Uh, the number one thing is probably to take inventory of your existing capabilities. Do you have the expertise and the headcount and you know, the resources to build this successfully in house or should you lean on uh, outside expertise, whether that's an agency partner strategy consultants, anyone who can kind of guide you through the process. Uh, you mentioned a great example of a company that said, hey, we want to build this internally. We want to turn our marketing team into the influencers and really own this. In other cases, you know, a big brand might say, well, you know, we have uh, agency of record. We have, you know, these resources that we're going to trust to, to help us test out or, or um, build our presence in influencer marketing and be successful. So that's kind of the first step is just identifying what's the strategy, what's the approach. Um, if you don't have experience or expertise, I do recommend asking for help. I mean, we, we can all think of countless examples of brands that have had kind of those big fail moments in social media, whether, you know, they tweeted something or, or posted something on Facebook that just uh, didn't resonate or they got a lot of blowback. The same thing is, is true with influencer campaigns, right? We've seen examples in which um, there's not 
enough thought or strategy behind the integration, or it's just, hey, let's let's give this person some money and see what they come up with. Uh, you know, that that doesn't always result in a successful outcome. So be uh, really conscientious about the approach, have intent behind it, and then you know find people, either internal experts or you know partners that can guide you through the process. And if you are sure you don't have enough resources internally, like what kind of budget should you be thinking about for like testing us out with like an agency? Uh, every agency is different. And depending on the platform and type of activation you're looking for, it will, it will differ, right? There are um, massive integrations you can do with the world's leading influencers all the way from, you know, the, the Kylie Jenners of the world to uh, some of the, you know, massive influencers that we all know, like, um, uh, the Try Guys or Dude Perfect, right? Some of these like massive influencers that have become household names. And then, you, or you can try to activate micro or nano influencers, people with a, a small following. So when we say micro influencers, we typically mean less than 10,000 followers on a given social platform. When we say nano influencers, we typically mean less than a thousand followers on a platform. Uh, obviously that can be different, right? 10,000 YouTube subscribers is a bit different than 10,000 um, Twitter followers or TikTok followers. So understand the nuances behind each platform, but those are kind of the rough benchmarks we use. And so that is going to dictate budget. The other thing that can dictate budget is, um, you know, are you activating a single influencer or multiple influencers? Is it a one-off piece of content? Is it a longer term, you know, uh, full year ambassador program, in which they'll produce multiple pieces of content often distributed across multiple platforms. So all, all those caveats being said, it depends, but you, you want to have meaningful budget. It should be in relation to what you're spending in other places. So uh, what is your average uh, pay-per-click ad budget? What is your uh, traditional digital spend budget? Are you doing TV ads? Think about influencer in relation to that uh, and have it be a meaningful percentage. You, you know, it's going to probably cost anywhere from a few thousand to tens of thousands, or if you're doing larger activations, there are six figure, seven figure, you know, scale influencer campaigns. It's going to, you know, adjust that based on the size of your brand and the marketing spends that you're, you're allocating elsewhere. When you're just getting your feet wet, um, where would you recommend like testing first where you're most likely to see like are you going, like, should you be devoting more of your like overall strategy to this? Like, what's a great place to start? If you have a small budget, a great place to start is find those who are already really enthusiastic about your brand, right? People who would talk about and be an influencer for your product without getting paid. Uh, you can, again, use software solutions like Paladin. There's a lot of other great tools you can leverage to identify who those people are. Maybe you know some of them because they engage with your content already on social. But if you can find who is, already has a proclivity to post about your content or is already having conversations around your product online, um, reach out to them. And, and maybe there are non-financial things you can offer them that make them even more excited and, and fuel their enthusiasm to be an ambassador. That could be early access to information because, hey, they're already talking about your brand. And if you give them kind of sneak peeks into stuff, it gives them uh, the ability to make content. Another thing you can do is free product giveaways that often tends to be a, a low cost way to, uh, to reach influencers. And so whether that's existing, you know, people who love your product or people who you think could be a natural fit. Um, and if, if they are not a full-time influencer, but a, a smaller influencer who would appreciate a free product, that's a great way to do it. You know, once you get into larger influencers, yeah, they get free products all the time this is their full-time job. So they, you know, they do expect to be paid in, in exchange for uh, creating content and, and, you know, broadcasting that to their audience. Uh, but those are often some good places to start where you can get your feet wet. You don't have to put a lot of budget behind it. And then you can kind of test and learn, Hey, is influencer marketing successful for us? Keep in mind that all of those different tiers may have different results. So just because you don't see the results you want with one approach, doesn't mean that all influencer marketing won't work for you. You might need to test one strategy and then learn and, and revise based on that and then continue to experiment. Yeah, that's great. And uh, I mean, it's always intimidating when you're like doing outreach to anything new where you're not really sure like what to offer, et cetera. Have you seen any good uh, educational materials or articles about like how you should structure that initial outreach to influencers that like, 
gets them excited and also like gets the conversation started? Yeah, uh, there are plenty of great resources online. Uh, one, one piece of uh, information I think is really useful is a newsletter called Influence Weekly. Uh, Andrew Campy, the, the great mind behind it who publishes it, uh, collates all, it, it collects all of these incredible resources across the influencer marketing uh, industry and often highlights past uh, campaign examples. So there's good case studies and, and, uh, and uh, inspiration that can be found from the newsletter. Uh, he also kind of points to really good other publications that talk about influencer marketing. So seek those out. I'm sure with a, a little bit of light Googling, you can find some great uh, recipes and examples. Uh, and then if you're working with an agency, ask them to share case studies, strategies that have worked and maybe what hasn't worked in the past. Uh, make sure to, to kind of check the references and see if they've worked in your category or at least um, with the types of influencers that you want to engage. Uh, oftentimes influencer agencies will specialize or they'll just naturally have relationships and in a few sectors. So they may have done a lot of work in gaming or they may have done a lot of work in parenting or um, you know, QSR or you know, uh, any other uh, of these kind of verticals. So uh, make sure that they have experience with the type of brand that, that uh, reflects what you're looking for and then that they can also be a trusted resource to, to help you on your journey. Yeah, I'd love to, to look and uh, explore that a bit. So with like affiliates, um, agencies having relationships there is like super critical because affiliates are so busy. They tend to be unresponsive unless they know who they're talking to beforehand. Is it the same with influencers? Like, should I not work with an agency who has not worked in my vertical before? Should I have to, should I find an agency specific for the vertical? Or is it more like it just depends and it's really about just doing the work? Yeah, not necessarily. I think there are certain verticals that are so large and well-established that you will find people who are so focused on that and best in their craft for, you know, fashion, beauty, PR, and influencer, or gaming, again, tends to be one of those uh, verticals where there is expertise. The types of influencers that are going to be a good fit are probably pretty specific. Um, so, you know, that, that those might be the exceptions to the rule. But there are, in many cases agencies with expertise across many verticals, across many brands. And again, as we, we touched on earlier, you don't just have to um, work with influencers from the vertical that, that your brand is advertising to. Oftentimes those creative collaborations or cross-pollinations between uh, an influencer whose content tends to, top, tends to speak to one specific um, area uh, doesn't necessarily need to be the exact same um, focus that the brand creates products around. It can be a natural fit for their audience who just you know, doesn't get inundated with this type of messaging all the time. It's, it's, a, it's a refreshing new piece of content or information for that as a result. Yeah, makes sense. Cool. Um, so, I mean, there's always sensational stories about how influencers are completely incapable of selling a single product. Um, have you, like, what do you think that those brands are doing wrong, which is like leading them to think that influencer, like influencers can't drive sales? Yeah, so uh, in terms of the sensational stories, most of them result from just misalignment between the brand and the influencer, right? There's, there's no intent behind it. There's no strategic thinking in terms of what can we do that will really be a powerful piece of content that the influencer is proud to make, the brand is proud to sponsor and stand behind and the audience is excited to watch, right? You know, I find that with some of the content I watch on social, there are native ads uh, and I, I don't skip it, right? Like I'll listen to podcasts and it's like you, you easily could skip this advertisement, but the host is, makes it funny or engaging or they, you know, maybe it's a product that really is tailored to you and so you want to learn more about it. Uh, those tend to leave a better impact. They have better recall. They have um, probably better conversion as a result. And so start with that, right? Again, it, it comes down to nailing down the goal, making sure there's strong alignment between the brand and the influencer, and then, you know, making sure there's measurement and optimization built into your process. But what we're talking about now is kind of how do we take a step from generating top of funnel awareness? So impressions and reach and engagement, all of which are well and good, but how are we optimizing for bottom of funnel performance oriented actions, right? And that's where, you know, leveraging software like Paladin and also what Everflow brings to the table in terms of 
incredible attribution tracking, right? Clicks, measuring conversions, identifying, hey, these channels are working successfully for you. These influencers are a great fit. And, and we see strong results from this kind of audience model or this influencer personality. And we're seeing underperforming results uh, in this category. And maybe it's no one's fault. It's just that that's not, uh, it's not eliciting the type of response we're looking for from that audience. So lean on the, the tools and expertise at your disposal, seek out great partners and technology platforms like, you know, what Everflow and similar um, affiliate marketing solutions bring to bear, because whether it's, you know, link tracking, cookies, right, all these other forms for attribution modeling, that can be a great way of identifying when does the purchase consideration happen, right? Because I might get exposed to an ad, whether that's a traditional ad or an influencer ad, and I might not be looking for that product right away. But because I follow that channel, I've been exposed to it maybe a few times, I have stronger recall because it was natively integrated. When my purchase journey begins, I'm more likely now as a result to think back to, oh, hey, I remember you know, that home security system or that VPN product or that, you know, toy for my kid this holiday season, the parenting product, you know, countless examples because I heard about it on that podcast or through that newsletter or on that, you know, social content um, that I watched. And that's when the journey begins. And so, you know, with a traditional ad experience, if someone doesn't click the ad, hey, we lost them, right? But with effective affiliate and influencer marketing closely joined together, you can say, hey, that person saw an ad two weeks, four weeks, six weeks ago, but because we had a cookie for that user, we, we, or they use the coupon code or whatever other means that the influencer is using to drive, um, uh, to continue to keep that brand top of mind when they come back and, and, and are ready to undertake the purchase, we now can successfully tie that back to the influencer and the creative that, that, uh, prompted the, the interest from the consumer. Cool. And I know that we have a lot of clients at Everflow that would love to get into influencer marketing and start driving uh, like sales or leads or subscriptions, et cetera. Um, can you walk through sort of like if they could be, if you could hold their hand through the process of using Paladin to recruit like uh, influencers and then drive performance through it, like can you walk through that process, what it would look like? if that yeah. were possible to do with every single customer? Sure. So it begins with all of the uh, strategy elements that we've already discussed, but say they've um, got, you know, just a super clever idea. They've got an awesome product that's perfectly aligned with the audience. It's just about, okay, how do we pinpoint that right influencer, the right personality uh, in order to engage them? Well, they can come to a platform like Palette and they can use our technology to pinpoint who are the right influencers to, to talk about this or to create this content in partnership with, right? We've built a search engine that uh, tracks 55 million global influencers across every country, category, language, you know, you name it. Um, and you can find everyone from the biggest influencers that are the household names down to the small emerging micro influencers or nano influencers. And you can do that, you know, with a variety of search filters. So that's where we, that's the, the data, the, the science uh, part of it. Right. And then once you right, let's stop uh, there, sorry. what is like a great way to structure the search? Like, what should you be searching in that search uh, box yeah. to find like an influencer for something like what kind of things is like the best filter for it? Sure. So let's start with, um, you know, some of the obvious ones, right? You're going to want them to have a certain number of followers, right? The, the audience size needs to be meaningful on the platforms of choice. So maybe you've identified your audience spends time on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. We're going to search specifically on those platforms to pinpoint the right influencers. Um, from there, hey, they need to have an, a certain number of followers. We want someone with at least 10,000 followers because we want our message to reach a, a given size audience. Um, but we probably don't want anyone with more than a million followers because our budget is small and we're not going to be able to afford to pay someone who commands you know, a really high rate for an integration. So you can get very specific with the number of followers. Your product might only be sold in, in specific markets. Uh, you know, now the internet and uh, e-commerce has changed that. But in some cases, maybe your product's only available in North America or you know, in Europe. And so you want to filter down for influencers based in those countries and or influencers with audience in those countries. 
Uh, from there, you might want to look for specific keywords uh, that reflect your brand values or the type of content uh, that you're looking for. So it's a combination of those elements, right? Language. And for the keywords, are those yeah. like specifically things that they're mentioning in their content? What, what are those keywords that are actually showing up? Sure. So, um, you know, maybe we're trying to promote a new health and wellness product. So we want people who already talk about health and wellness. That, those could be the keywords. It could be yoga, Pilates, right? Some of these other uh, things that are tied closely to that. And, and those values and practices will be reflected in the influencer's content. Uh, you know, if it's, hey, we're selling a product specifically to parents, uh, then, you know, you need to target mommy bloggers, you know, parenting content, um, uh, pregnancy, anything that, that might be very specific to your product, you can pinpoint through keywords. And what we do that's a bit unique, perhaps in our, our influencer search tool, is we don't just show you, okay, you know, these are the social accounts that post about it. We actually look at the volume of content that they create using those keywords. So, hey, these are the people who are most often talking about yoga. These are the people uh, in the U.S. that reach women 18 to 34 who are uh, talking about health and wellness, right? And when you can laser in on those specific keywords and see the volume of content they create and the audience conversations that originate around that content, that is the most meaningful signal that they're going to be a good fit, right? Um, again, you, you, you want to find people who are based on your audience. And so if they are regularly talking about the types of content or espousing the values and the characteristics or attributes of your product that you want to emphasize, then that's going to, that, that's going to result in the most resonant connections between a brand and an influencer. Okay. Now that we found them, what's mm -hmm. the next step? Yep. So you can engage the influencer. Uh, sometimes they'll list a business email address, right, where they're open to inquiries. In other cases, uh, you can direct message them uh, through their social accounts. You know, our philosophy is influencers are busy. They already have a million places to be and they don't want another tool to log into. So we haven't tried to force the behavior of, hey, the brand and the influencer need to try and um, only keep their communication confined to this platform. We say, hey, engage with the influencer where they want to be communicated with. So again, email, direct message. Sometimes they will have representation and they'll say, hey, please speak with my manager or my agency. Um, and then that, that's a good way to, to go about it. Uh, but once you've got a, you know, a dialogue going, you can say, hey, you know, express something meaningful about why you want to work with the influencer. We've been doing the search. This is the product. We found your content and we love it, right? They give specific examples. We watched these videos, we saw these posts and, uh, you know, personally we're big fans and we, we like kind of the tone that you strike with your audience. We think you would be the perfect person to approach a partnership with, um, you know, we'd love to discuss it and then understand what the influencers expectations would be in return, whether that's financial, whether that's, you know, product oriented or, or anything else. And so there's going to be some conversations some back and forth to figure out what the right structure is and then think about the creative strategy. Uh, and then we kind of, once that's in place, then we move to the next phase, which is really the campaign execution piece. So let's talk about the campaign execution. Let's piece. do it. So you've found the right influencer. You've agreed on the business terms, right? Contracts are in place. Deliverables are outlined. Now it's a matter of, okay, let's think of the, the, the great piece of, of content we can work on together. Again, in many cases, this should be a partnership. It shouldn't be fully one-sided where it's just the influencer who's going to run with an idea. There have been cases of that where it's worked out brilliantly, like the famous Casey Neistat Nike commercials example. Um, but it also doesn't want to be just creative jam down the influencer's throat by a brand because that won't come across as authentic. It'll feel like an ad. It'll be interruptive and, and it'll be um, inauthentic and not evoke the trust uh, that the influencer has built with the audience. So collaborate on what that, that creative strategy is, and then think about what's the right way to convey this to the audience. Is it an Instagram story? Is it a carousel or a video uh, on your Instagram timeline? Is it a YouTube video? Is it a TikTok uh, video? Is it a, a piece of creative that can live and breathe in many places and we need to tailor parts of the content, but there's going to be an element that's um, on YouTube for long form, then there's gonna be a teaser video on TikTok that drives people to you know, the Instagram story or the YouTube video, you kind of work on those pieces in, in collaboration or conjunction with each other. And then the last piece is, you know, when is this going to go live? How is the influencer going to promote it? How is the brand going to help promote it? Whether that's through additional paid means and, and leveraging other parts of their digital strategy to push the influencer creative, 
or is it the, or, the brand's organic social activity that's also going to help boost the initial uh, activation behind the post? Because there's a few things you want to be careful of. You want to make sure the, the content is really successful out of the gate because the way, just the way that social platforms work is the search engines will index content pretty early on in the life cycle within kind of the first 48 to 72 hours. So out of the gate, you want to make sure that it has strong viewership and engagement from the audience. Uh, you, can, you can do that through a little bit of paid media activation up front, or you can make sure that the influencer and the brand are, are heavily pushing it organically on social. Um, and so that's kind of the, the first piece. And then the, the next bit is um, what is the what is the measurement time horizon? Is it a month long campaign? Is it, um, you know, a, a, a flash sale where you're doing 24 hours? Think about the time horizon. And especially if it's performance oriented, if you're driving a sale, right? Maybe it's Black Friday, you've got a holiday promotion coming up. If we're tying it back to an affiliate model and maybe even that's part of the compensation for the influencer where you're going to give them uh, a commission on any product sales uh, so, you know, you want to be able to tie that back in a given window. Maybe the influencer is getting paid for uh, any activity driven in the first 30 days. So you want to be closely aligned on that time frame and make sure you're, you have active touch points on it and clear um, tracking through a platform like Everflow to make sure that the influencer has visibility into how the content's doing and, and not just how the, the metrics that they can see on their side, make sure they're giving visibility into the social performance to the brand through a platform like Paladin where they can grant read only data access and the brand can follow along in real time to make sure that the campaign is performing. But the simultaneously, the influencer needs access to the clicks, the conversion data that's coming from, if, if we're driving product sales and we're thinking about performance marketing, they need visibility into that because there might be things that they can tweak on the back end, whether it's metadata, like the title tag or description of the post, um, in order to boost performance of it uh, uh, as the campaign goes on. Awesome. And say the influencer just destroys it and sends a ton of, ton of sales. Mm -hmm. How often should the brand continue to promote with that influencer? Like, do you have any guidelines about what to do with like the influencers that are a really good fit? Like how often can you work with them? When are you, when is it going to be pushing it? Any thoughts there? Yeah. Uh, if it's working, keep doing it, right? And influencers will recognize that too. So those are the signs of a successful partnership. And so in that case, you don't want it to look at it as just a one-off engagement. Hey, we did this activation. Black Friday sales were huge. We we're very happy. The influencer was well compensated. They got a great piece of content. Everybody wins. Go back to them and say, hey, this was really successful for us. We'd love to do more together and think about creating a maybe more ongoing series of content. Uh, maybe they can be a brand ambassador and, and you have a longer term engagement. Maybe it's a year or two year partnership where they're going to create multiple assets, uh, maybe pieces of content that will connect together and there's storytelling, there's a format and a narrative arc among all of that content. Um, and then maybe there's other ways to, to compensate them so that ongoing sales of the product tie back to that influencer, right? Through coupon codes or through affiliate tracking. Um, those are the best scenarios, right? I think really what we're seeing is a move towards more of those long-term partnerships. And when brands find an influencer that works, influencers too, you know, it, they know that their audience can uh, count on them to recommend products that they trust. So if they're always talking about a specific product and saying, I really do use this, I love it, here's why, um, then the audience respects that more than, okay, they did, you know, a Nike campaign this month, doing Adidas next month, then it's Reebok, right? Like they're always just talking about a different shoe. That doesn't really make me uh, feel like they're using these products so that I have the level of trust. Whereas if this influencer is talking about this product once a month or is making a video about this, you know, every quarter, I know that they really do stand behind this brand and, and there's meaningful interest in and using it, and I should I should consider looking into it as well. Yeah, that's a really excellent point. That if it's a good fit, like your both sides are benefiting from it because if their audience is buying your product in like droves, that means that your their audience really likes your product, and it works well for the influencer to talk about products that their audience like. Yeah. Cool. So twenty twenty, obviously, so much stuff has changed this year. Um, have you seen influencer marketing becoming more performance oriented? I think that's a trend we've been observing for a few years now, right? When social platforms came out 
uh, they didn't have as much robust analytics as they offer today, right? You think about even platforms like Snapchat where you had no visibility into your audience demographics. You didn't know how many followers you had or, or if you were working with a, a brand or a, an influencer, what their social reach necessarily looked like. You did it because Snapchat was cool and, and that's where you know you thought you thought audiences were spending time. You know, there will always be a, a bit of that with you know early entrants and new platforms, but influencer marketing has matured as we've gotten better analytics and more reliable real-time reporting from the platforms. And so along with that, influencer marketing has matured and brands have been getting smarter and performance oriented brands have found a way to find, you know, to, to drive success with this, um, with these marketing tactics. So yes, we've observed this over time. It's a trend that's, that's going to continue. Um, and particularly because when influencer marketing really works to drive results, then as a performance marketer, you can continue to rely on that as an effective channel. So we do expect to see more of that in, in 2021. I think there's a, a few other things we can forecast as well. Um, more of those long-term brand ambassador programs that we talked about, a move towards also the uh, employees as affiliates or customers as affiliates to, to, to drive those impact campaigns where you've got you know, these existing uh, ambassadors for your brand and you want to turn them into champions for your product. Um, the other thing is, you know, watch new platforms, right? Uh, Pinterest has been doing some really interesting things in video and leaning into the influencer world a bit more. So very excited about what they're doing. It's not a platform that many people think of for influence per se, because we don't necessarily have personalities that we follow, but you know, my fiance and planning a wedding, like a lot of that activity is happening on Pinterest. So there's absolutely an effective way to influence those, those um, conversations. Uh, Pinterest is also great for recipes. There's all these kind of you know, uh, applications that these platforms can have that make it really well suited to influencers. Um, aside from that, LinkedIn right, has been leaning into live streaming and video and is, I think, really the premier platform for, for B2B uh, you know, brands to build an audience and engage with, with people in a professional setting. So continue to watch what LinkedIn is doing. Uh, and then ultimately, you know, TikTok has, has um, uh, grabbed headlines this year. They've, they've been doing a really good job of making sure that the traditional types of influencers we think about want to be on the platform. It's still fun. They have these kind of challenges and engaging formats of video, um, you know, younger audiences. Kids love being on the platform because that's where their favorite stars are. And and they're seeing really fun and uh, short form content. Uh, Instagram is obviously trying to, to keep up with that, not just natively through stories and, and um, timeline posts, but with the, the launch of Reels this year as a way of having interactive kind of short form video. Um, and then Twitch, right? we haven't really talked too much about Twitch today, but Twitch is leading the way in terms of live streaming, not just for gaming, but now rapidly expanding to other, other verticals. So um, very bullish on, on Twitch and, and also the, the gaming and esports space, which has flocked to the platform, uh, but you know, also see it as, as a great, uh, platform and channel for other types of verticals to, to build an audience on. Awesome. And do you think that there's any uh, direct to consumer brands that you've seen, like, especially killing it with influencers? Absolutely. And I think that's a, another thing that we're going to continue to observe heading into next year, social commerce, right? Influencers are launching their own brands. Uh, influencers are becoming um, affiliates and ambassadors for other, other products. Um, I'm fortunate to serve as an advisor to a company called Flash FOMO, which started out of Australia, and they help influencers create um, branded products and sell them through flash sales and also create uh, their own shops where they can uh, drive fans to purchase products. That's a trend that's only going to continue, and um, we're seeing great success stories there from products that influencers are developing themselves as well as you know, brands that are um, driving social commerce and leveraging influencers to increase product sales and conversion. Awesome. And what are you most bullish on uh, in the next few years for like the next big opportunity? Sure. Well, you know, we talk a lot about influencer marketing on social, and that's where you know us at, at Paladin spend most of our time. But I'd say podcasting is an area which we're uh, watching keenly. It's, you know, we, I, I host a podcast called All Things Video. And, and so I've been a podcaster now for five years and I sit down and, and interview people all across the digital media landscape, typically other entrepreneurs and thought leaders in music and gaming and influencer marketing and beyond. So 
Um, having been really close to the format for a while, I've seen a rapid growth and, and evolution of podcasting and, and love listening to podcasts. And I think, you know, the industry through the uh, very um, uh, bullish activity of Spotify, Apple, and other key players, they're, they're advancing the industry rapidly. And then of course, voice technology through smart speakers and, and uh, smart assistants like Siri and Alexa, they are paving the way for voice to become a more dominant uh, operating system in the way that we interact with our devices. And podcasting is part of that, that voice um, revolution. So I would say watch that as another great channel for influencer marketing. And then newsletters, right? I mean, as unsexy as it sounds, like I find myself um, getting really great insights and subscribing to um, newsletters as a way to replace, you know, probably some of the traditional broadcast television news or uh, maybe print news outlets that I was subscribing to before. I don't, I don't need my information necessarily come from a big publisher. I'm just as happy getting it from a really smart individual who's thinking about something in a deep way and it's carefully curated to topics that I'm very interested in. I think that's why newsletters are, are making a comeback and now they have a way to monetize whether through Substack or other types of sponsorships that you know we're seeing newsletters become this really powerful way of um, not just sharing content and information but also you know being an effective channel for influencer marketing. Yeah the rise of Substack has been amazing. I definitely follow more and more Substack writers just because like there's so many great writers there and really you want to you want like authors that you trust to sort of like break through all of the like chef chef and like get really to like the the heart of like whatever the topic is because like there's so much like misinformation online and everything so it's much easier to understand that this specific author, like I know where they're coming from. I know that they've thought about this in a very smart way and that they've looked at like, they, they've figured out what to like ignore and what things are going to be misleading mm -hmm. and then creating content around that. And you can't do that with a full news organization because there's so many factors that you don't really know like what's gone into creating this article you're reading. Mm -hmm. But with an individual author, you can really see the process they've gone through to get to whatever they're writing about. And I, I think it does make a big difference. Like it's much easier to trust an individual than an organization. Yep. And that the era of um, trust in those editorial brands has eroded a bit, right? We used to look to uh, the New York Times or ABC News, or, you know, that was where, that was where the personalities were based. We could see you know, Walter Cronkite, or we could follow this really great journalist from the Times. And not to say that doesn't still happen, absolutely does. But again, with the internet democratizing access to uh, information, and anyone can be a self-published author, podcast host, you know, social media influencer, uh, it's easier to find those voices that really resonate with you, you want to listen to, you want to subscribe. It's That's been become more powerful than ever before. Awesome. Uh, so we had a question from the audience. Uh, so they ask, as a, as a growing brand on Shopify, trying to establish our influencer program, what are the key building blocks we should consider for our marketing tech stack? Yeah, great question. And thank you uh, for asking. If anyone else has questions from the audience, we'd love to hear them. Um, I would say, you know, number one, you're, you're probably already using some of the great Shopify analytics that are native to the platform and probably web analytics like, like Google Analytics or something similar. So um, those are the, the bare necessities. But beyond that, you want to look to uh, an affiliate marketing solution, you know, Everflow being a great example, and also an influencer marketing software solution to help you track the, that process from end to end. So everything from influencer discovery to CRM, tracking influencer relationships to activation, measuring social content performance, post activity, audience demographics, right? All of the key information about how the content performs can be done on the influencer marketing side. And then oftentimes, you know, they'll have uh, a nice handoff point or a strong technical integration where, okay, it's a natural fit now for the affiliate marketing partner to pick up the click tracking conversions, um, you know, measuring sales and, and even like, you know, other types of uh, softer brand lift or, or um, uh, if they run surveys, they can do things like uh, purchase intent. So, you know, you want to have all of those pieces in the funnel from web analytics, Shopify analytics, uh, you need your influencer marketing, uh, dashboard and tool set. And then that, that should tie in nicely with your affiliate marketing solution. And when all 
of those pieces come together, uh, it's a beautiful thing. Awesome. And if people want to learn more about Paladin, like what's the best way for them to uh, learn what your platform's capable of and what opportunities it opens up? Yeah. So we are paladinsoftware.com, P-A-L-A-D-I-N, uh, Paladin Software. You can find us uh, online to the site. You can engage with us on social. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn, James Creech. So if you have any direct questions, feel free to reach out. Love connecting with people there. Uh, share a lot of updates uh, of what we're building and, and also um, you know, other things that I'm interested in working on. So love connecting with people on LinkedIn as well. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. I think uh, we definitely explored some really awesome stuff about like doing influencer marketing right and like breaking down how it actually works because I think that is always hard to figure out like what am I actually supposed to be doing rather than what do I think I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah. No, thank you so much, Michael. It was a pleasure. I uh, it was delighted to be here and great to uh, get to share some insights and, and answer some questions from the audience. Thanks again. Likewise. Thank you so much and have a wonderful weekend.